Russia has agreed to provide cluster munitions to Ukraine, but just what are they, and are they really going to have that big an impact on the battlefield? And why are some countries saying that it is not even legal to do so? I think they're hypocrites. We're going to show you why here in a minute. It's July 8th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Let's get into it. Okay, first, as always, we're going to take a look at the control map. And the two biggest changes are the Russian forces falling back near Klachivka and Novodarivka. So when we zoom in near uh, Novodarivka, right, you can see actually here's the change here. Uh, outside Novodarivka, Russian forces falling back actually what looks like several kilometers. Let's see if we can get the, uh, get the ruler out here and try to take a measurement from the furthest point. Do I think this is the the smallest this is three kilometers about of a uh, total change so not insignificant uh again in terms of the uh withdrawal of russian forces now in the grand scheme of things probably not all that much because this is a salient and russian forces probably recognize that this is a tough place to hold you can see there's not really great defensive positions they are sort of on the south side of this river here and the north side of this other river um but you know the russian forces right in the north of this reservoir network uh the, these guys are it, it's a tough spot to fight right you don't want to fight with your back against a hard to cross obstacle so they probably withdrew um right under in good order, good order uh but certainly they've withdrawn a significant uh distance even though the territory that's actually changed hands is not all that meaningful this may be i suspect part of a ukrainian effort to isolate Stadomayorsk, which is in both the low ground and and is pretty well defended by uh, Russian forces. So I suspect that they are instead trying to move near Priyudine and just sort of apply pressure along the flanks of Stadomayorsk. Um, looking at Bakhmut, right, where we're seeing much more significant Ukrainian gains, um, or rather consistent Ukrainian gains, uh, you can see that, again, there is some level of progress marginal though it may be um south of klitschivka uh probably again just a small windbreak flipping from russian controlled uh to ukrainian controlled you also see ukraine russian forces being pushed out of this narrow windbreak here where it looks like russian forces are trying to hold this canal Again, a good sign that they're getting peeled back from it, um, since this canal can be a very strong point to hold, since it would canalize any Ukrainian forces that attempt to cross. So, again, I think this strategy of rolling back Bakhmut um, may be the most effective for Ukraine, as we've talked about Uh while Bakhmut itself is not significant, and this is a common misconception and people, you know, in the comments are out there saying, oh, you said Bakhmut didn't mean anything when the Russians took it, but now you think it's important when the Ukrainians take it. Um, it's true. The value of Bakhmut remains marginal. What makes this valuable is that in Zaporizhia, as I've talked about, Russian forces have been digging in. As you can see, there is an extensive fortification network that's been constructed all along Zaporizhia. Uh, and this is just what we know about and have verified. There's a lot more of probably unverified positions that have been built up. And you can see, right, outside of Bakhmut, it's just much, much less, right? You're going to go several kilometers, and especially as you get in the southern part near Klitschivka, Kurdyumivka, you can see there's a big hole in the Russian defenses. And this is where you want to push, right? The reason there's such a huge gap in defenses is because while Russia has spent months building up the defensive network in Zaporizhia, in Bakhmut, they've been focused on the offense. They haven't been laying mines or digging trenches or pre-planning -pre fires. They have been on the offense. And as I've talked about, again, for literally months, uh, it, when you're on the offense, by definition, you can't be on the defense. And so it means that if you, Ukraine wants to counterattack somewhere, they should attack where the enemy has not been preparing for a defensive fight, which is basically only Bakhmut. Um, again, you can see here an entire decently built defensive line exists all the way through this region. Literally, the only gap is right here, uh, right here. Uh, and I think this is a sign, right, an indication that for Ukraine, 
this is probably the place they want to fight. If they could penetrate through Kurdyumivka or Klitschivka and turn the enemy south, you can see that right this defensive network is is meant to take uh, assaults from the front, right? And it's not meant to receive. Uh, it's not meant to repel a assault from the north. And that's what like something like this is. But you can see there's this is just not a well built. This is a softest spot in this whole defensive line. And that's where I think Ukraine really wants to try to make its mark where its best chances of success are. Uh, So we're going to see again how things play out. But the real story, again, that I think is really important to talk about is that the uh, U.S. has announced that it's going to include in its aid package to the to Ukraine uh, cluster munitions. What are cluster munitions? Before we talk about that, I wanted to quick shout out the Strategic Sit Rep. This is a newsletter I launched in response to how incredibly clickbait filled the Russian or the really the Ukraine Russian war news coverages and national security and geopolitical news in general. So this is a once a week newsletter. We give you the three most important stories in the whole national security space, Israel, Palestine. And we tell you not just a a, a, a dispassionate summary of the story, but we we give you the so what? What does it mean that this that this is occurring. And so this is the context that I think is neglected by a lot of news outlets. So if you're interested, you can sign up for free, uh, you know, just go to the strategic set rep or strategic set rep.com slash subscribe link is in the description and up here. Um, and be sure to check it out. Okay, so the White House has indeed said that they are providing cluster munitions to Ukraine. And, it, it, you know, it is it It says that they have been banned by about two thirds of NATO members due to their high civilian casualty rates. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan defended the decision, saying the U.S. will provide a version of the munitions with a reduced dud rate to minimize the risk of unexploded bomblets. However, human rights groups called for an immediate halt to such munitions. This is sort of political theater, right? And nothing is more hypocritical and cringy uh, than, of course, the U.K. Rishi, Rishi Sunak saying the U.K. discourages use of cluster bombs in Ukraine. Um. And again, they're uh, one of the countries that has signed a convention banning their use, um, but it will continue to provide long range rep weapons to Ukraine against Russia. Um, President Biden defended the decision to supply these weapons to Ukraine, stating they were running out of ammunition while Zelensky praised the move as timely. What is a cluster munition exactly? Well, a cluster munition is a uh, airdrop or ground launched explosive weapon that releases or ejects smaller sub munitions. Uh, The most commonly thought of as well, the small bombs, right? So here is an example of an early 1960 cluster munition. Uh, Obviously it's cut away so you can see what it contains, but you can see it contains a series of small bomblets that when this weapon detonates, when the main warhead detonates, it's going to scatter these bombs across an area of the battlefield. These are actually uh, M134s filled with sarin gas. Um, But Right, they come in all sorts of different flavors. Here's another example of a small bomblet from the Vietnam War, which has small fins to kind of guide it to the ground and then detonates on impact. Uh, so there's lots and lots of different ways they've existed. Again, here's a cluster munition designed by the USSR in 1939, 1940 that they used against uh, Finland. So there's so many. And they come in different uh, flavors, so to speak. Obviously, incendiary are ones that are designed to start fires or firebombs, like white phosphorus or napalm, that can be used to uh, destroy forested areas or target uh, developed uh, urban areas, right? Like, you know, now imagine imagine a, a village where most of the buildings are made of wood. An incendiary weapon would reduce the ability of uh, an enemy to use them for cover or concealment. Uh, anti-personnel is what you think of, right? Small bombs that explode. Anti-tank actually are, uh, warheads designed to pierce the armor of tanks and armored fighting vehicles. But in most cases, there's some sort of basic guidance system that helps deliver these munitions because they have to be bigger. The warhead will have fewer of them, but it will, but a crude guidance system will help find and, and guide them down to land on an enemy armored vehicle. Um, you can also use mine laying uh, cluster munitions. These are something that we've seen Russia routinely use and Ukraine routinely use, where munition scatters and deploys mines that float down to the ground. Um, right. 
uh, the U.S. has, they actually call it the aerial deni- Area Denial Artillery Munition. Um, and this, well, uh, this uh, actually deploys tripwires automatically after landing that make clearing the minefield much more difficult. Um, and it's designed to make large areas of the battlefield impassable. Um, and the scatterable mines, though used by the United States, self-destruct between 4 and 48 hours. Very short windows of efficacy. Um, And so the internationally agreed upon definition of cluster munitions uh, may not include this type of weapon since landmines are covered by other international treaties. And of course they come in some exotic flavors like uh, an anti-electric weapon or a soft bomb that can, uh, you know, basically short circuit electrical power grids or other uh, high tech electrical substations. Um, or even drop things like propaganda leaflets, right? So I say this because I want to point out that that scatterable artillery has been routinely used in this conflict, right? And this is an article from uh, a couple of days ago, June. Actually, it's from today, but it reports that the U.S. is firing artillery shells, or the Ukraine already has artillery shells that lay mines built to destroy tanks. The U.S. has sent 10,000 of these anti-tank artillery rounds along with 155 howitzer or M777s that fire them. Um, and Russian troops, right, defending against Ukraine's advance, are discovering that many of their supply lines and reserve uh, routes are mined as the attack happens, right? So that, of course, the... Russian mill bloggers are reporting on this um, and we're observing, of course, that these mines self-destruct after about four to 48 hours, meaning that the attacks have to be lightning fast and the timing has to be really good to make for them to be effective. Um, and, it, you know, they say that engineering, right, uh, sappers easily cope with these munitions. And it's true. You literally just have to identify the route where they've been deployed, wait four to 48 hours and then proceed down the route. Um, it, it, it's a huge, huge disadvantage relative to uh, Russia, who is willing to use um, uh, de- cluster munitions that deploy mines that do not explode, meaning that these areas are denied, uh, uh, these routes can be denied to Ukrainian forces until they go through the tedious process of mine clearing. But I point this out because, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of this is political theater right these cluster munitions the reason they are banned when they are uh, anti-personnel is because a certain percentage of these small simple bombs um that get released are defective and so they land unexploded and run the risk of harming civilians now this is also true of artillery shells right these big artillery shells that get fired a certain percentage of them are also duds and also sit on fields waiting for unsuspecting civilians to detonate them uh so the danger is not that much greater with cluster munitions and the the use of weapons like these scatterable mines that also have a certain percentage of duds create a sort of false sense that cluster munition bans have uh, are more effective than they are and it's not clear what that this is that this sort of controversy is anything other than again political theater especially by the uk right i'm bothered by the uk because they are the ones who provided some of the deployable minefields that targeted russian forces in volodar um to great effect they were extremely effective and using cluster munitions again will it be like a game changer on the battlefield maybe not but what it can do really effectively is area dispersal and it can really russian troops that are moving in the open especially counterattacking russian troops um good you could really blunt those efforts by using cluster munitions right because we know that one of the strategies and tactics that russia is uh using in its defensive fight is that when ukraine advances and takes russian positions russians have pre-planned counterattacks that they immediately have russian troops come out of their positions and push the ukrainians out before they have a chance to reinforce so if they were to have access to cluster munitions um 
they may be more effective at stopping these Russian counterattacks before they're able to drive Ukrainian forces out. Um, it, 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 so that's, I think, what the battlefield use they're asking for is. Again, is it a game changer? Is it a superstar weapon? No, it's probably not. But nonetheless, it does have the potential to give Ukraine a new tool in its toolkit, brings them back on par with Russia. And again, I think... I don't want to say these concerns about civilians are overblown, but at this point, you at this point, one, they're already deploying munitions that to a lay person you would call a cluster munition. Um, and two, the fear of unexploded ordnance is still it is it, still vast. It's going to be a huge problem in these areas because of the vast numbers of artillery shells that are fired. So you it, it's almost like there's you're going to have to clear these fields anyway so why not give ukrainians the best tools possible again that's like my this is my analysis and i know it's like controversial to sit there and be like they're banned by treaty yeah so then why do we have mines that you can deploy from an artillery shell anyway that's really all I had. As always, guys, thank you a ton to uh, members of CombatVetNews.com. Um, you guys are the ones who make this entire thing possible, really keeping me independent out here. Uh, thanks to our Colonel Tier members. Thanks to our Lieutenant Tier members. Um, we just dropped a video on Combat Vet News yesterday looking at some of the combat footage from uh, from this counteroffensive. So be sure to check it out. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next one.